Well, hello again, and welcome back to Viper Bites, the show where we talk everything and anything, and right now we've been going through some training camp battles. We've talked about the NFC West, we've talked about the East, we've talked about the North. Now it's time to kind of touch base on the NFC South. We're going to talk about the Atlanta Falcons. We're going to talk about the Carolina Panthers. We're going to get to the Super Bowl champs there in Tampa. And, of course, we'll talk about everything that's going on in New Orleans. But we got to kind of talk about a couple things because we are putting out some content out here with the Dynasty Vipers. And you know what? I haven't taken a crap in two weeks because, you know what? I I don't feel like we're going to be number two. I'm paraphrasing the great Garner Minshew, of course, with his recent quote in regards to Trevor Lawrence being drafted by the Jaguars. But I figured I wanted to throw that in here as well. Now... We touched base on the NFC North. We talked about why Chicago hates Anthony Miller. Well, recently Anthony Miller was traded. We will release that video, I think, on Sunday. It's Tuesday by the time you're watching this. Anthony Miller was traded to the Houston Texans for a late-round draft pick swap. So just so you know, we do have that under under control. But we want to make sure we're talking about these training camp battles as they're coming to you. Training camp is opening here right away. Let's get to the NFC South with those aforementioned Atlanta Falcons here. Run it right here. They give it to Todd Gurley over the top, trying to break the plane, and he's in for the touchdown. Here's a first down pass, deep for Julio Jones, and he's got it inside the 35-yard line. Beating Lano Hill deep. Every drop has the perfect steps to it. To time up with the route, just and the like end that. result is <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> Calvin Ridley was by himself. Couple of things there on that video, there clip. Todd Gurley, Julio Jones, neither one of them are there in Atlanta anymore. So that's going to bring us to our first little point: life without Julio. Matt Ryan still has Calvin Ridley. They've got themselves a unicorn, in Kyle Pitts. We'll talk about Pitts versus Hurst a little bit later here. Russell Gage, he stepped up a little bit last year, but how, how is Atlanta going to cope with the loss of Julio Jones? Now, right now, this depth chart consists of Calvin Ridley way up here. He's number one. He's the alpha. There's no question about it. But then we talk about Russell Gage. Can he fill that number two role? He did it so much when Julio was out, when Calvin kind of ascended to that number one spot. Russell Gage kind of played the Robin to Calvin Ridley's Batman in the absence of Julio Jones. Who else is there? We got Blake Christian. He's going to be there. Olamai Zacchaeus. He's there. Frank Darby, who they brought out of Arizona State. Tajay Sharp. Oh, man. There's a blast from the past. Tajay Sharp. And a bunch of undrafted free agents. Now, all these players together likely won't accumulate the yardage that Julio was able to put up or the attention that Julio garnered out there. So when we talk about Calvin Ridley, we know he can prove to be that wide receiver one. We've seen him do it in Julio's absence. Can he maintain that? over a prolonged period of time which Julio's not there. Julio demanded so much attention from opposition um, defensive coordinators that I don't think we've kind of gotten ready for that yet. Can Kyle Pitts maybe feel that? Can he get that attention? Uh, Kind of take a little bit away from Calvin Ridley? That's yet to be seen because rookie tight ends, I don't care if you're a unicorn or not, you got to prove it before I, I, I believe it 100%. Now, Naturally, you expect the run game to pick up some of that slack in Julio's absence. But when we look at this, we've got uh, Mike Thighs Davis there, Quadri Olison, Cardell Patterson, Javian Hawkins, and Caleb Huntley. Not exactly um, a formidable backfield, so to speak. Mike Davis did well when he was in Carolina, given the opportunity to film for Christian McCaffrey last year. Cordell Patterson may be the top running back, even though he's a wide receiver, even though he's their best special team. Anyway, you know where I'm going with this. Um, Last year, this offensive line was a 21st-ranked one, and that was really with one receiving threat. And now they're going to see these stack boxes. There's going to be a lot of double coverage on Calvin Ridley. We're going to see Russell Gage needing to step up. I believe he can do so. I believe with Calvin Ridley there and Kyle Pitts and a little bit of Hayden Hurst kind of sprinkled in there, Russell Gage can be that guy that you can get on there. Maybe plays a flex option on your fantasy roster, so he's going to have value. Trust in Russell Gage. I believe in him. Now, going back to Kyle Pitts. This is, I mentioned him being a unicorn. My man, Bo, he talks about him. He was on him from the hype train from the very get-go. 
Kyle Pitts has like the largest wingspan of any tight end over the last 20 years. He is a generational talent, so to speak. I know we use that term probably more often than we probably should nowadays, but at the tight end position in which it kind of dries up pretty quickly after the top four, top five, Kyle Pitts has an opportunity to kind of slide in as one of the top five tight ends in the National Football League right away. Now, how is that going to happen? It's rare that a tight end comes in and produces, but it's also uncommon that a tight end is drafted in a top four overall selection when it comes to the draft. That's how much the Falcons believe in this kid. Now, Hurst was traded last offseason. Uh, he's currently working on a four-year, $11 million contract. Um, 2020 was a disaster for Hurst, even by his own admission. Uh, he managed 56 catches, 571 yards, six touchdowns as a stat line. With essentially no number two wide receiver on the rust on the roster and a questionable run game, the Falcons will be probably seeing or spending a lot of time in a 12 personnel. Be ready to see a lot of Kyle Pitts, a lot of Hayden Hurst in their lineup right off the get-go. Maybe Russell Gage on the one side, along with Calvin Ridley. Now, both tight ends will be counted on to make these plays. It'll just come down to the steep leaning curve for Kyle Pitts, how quickly he picks up that playbook because he is going to be a offensive mismatch when it comes to defenses trying to key in on him. I don't think you can cover him with a linebacker and any safety coming down is going to be too small. You're going to need yourself a Jeremy Chin type guy or a Kyle Duggar type safety to kind of stay in tow with this phenom of a tight end. Now, we're going to head over to Carolina here in a second and talk about the Carolina Panthers and what they've been able to do. One second down, the pitch to McCaffrey. McCaffrey to the end zone for the touchdown. That was too easy. Second and eight. Bridgewater. Deep down the sideline. That pass is caught. Robbie Anderson. There's a penalty marker down as Anderson goes into the end zone. Now, that Robbie Anderson touchdown there, I really did not want to put in the film. Um, first off, it was against my Raiders. Second off, horrible coverage, forced him to hold it. But Robbie Anderson is that kind of guy. And here's the thing. That was with Teddy Bridgewater. Now he gets Sam Darnold back, a little bit of a reunion from back in their New York Jets days. And we're going to talk about Sam Darnold and what he can do for the Carolina Panthers. Now, when we talked about Broncos a little bit earlier, we talked about the inefficiency of Teddy Bridgewater late in games while trailing. He had five opportunities to come back or win a game on the final drive of the game. Failed to do so in each of the five. Now, since being drafted third overall out of UFC, it hasn't been pretty for Sam Darnold. The weapons, we talked about Robbie Anderson. He's probably the best weapon Sam Darnold has had in his career so far. And let's face it, Adam Gase era in New York didn't do anybody any of favors. Uh, with only a 59.8% completion percentage and a nearly one touchdown to one interception ratio, it was time for a change, and Carolina came, offered some draft picks, and the compensation really wasn't that much. You talk about a 2021 sixth, a 2022 second, a 2022 fourth. Pretty fair value to get uh, a player that you could develop into that solid quarterback of the future for the Carolina Panthers. Now, is he going to be a top 12 quarterback? No. Is he going to put up quarterback one weeks every once in a while? Possibly. You're talking about weapons he's never seen. You're talking about a uh, rookie coming in and Terrace Marshall. You're talking about the aforementioned Robbie Anderson. You're talking about Christian McCaffrey. There are some pieces there already in place in the Carolina Panthers that he's never had with the Jets or any point in his career. Maybe even more talented than anything he's had even at USC. And that's saying something. Now, we'll kind of take a step back here. Uh, paying the three draft picks for Darnold shows that someone in Carolina believes in him. And maybe that's what he really needs is someone to believe in him going forward. I don't know if he got that good old-fashioned pat on the back, you know, Sam, you're our guy kind of thing. I don't think he ever got that with the Jets after they drafted him. But someone there in Carolina obviously believes in him. But his contract expires in 2023. So he's got about a two-year audition period in Carolina. So... It's a good trade for Carolina, and I think this could rejuvenate Sam Darnold moving forward. Now, I keep talking about his familiarity with Robbie Anderson. They hooked up 102 times, 1,531 yards, 11 touchdowns already. And now you throw in the Christian McCaffrey factor, I think you're going to see a significant increase in that passing percentage, and that's going to help Carolina moving forward. 
Now, the other position to watch here in Carolina on the offensive side of the ball is the battle at tight end where you got Ian Thomas versus Dan Arnold versus Tommy Tremble. Now, the Panthers have some quality pass catching options. We talked DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Christian McCaffrey, and potentially Terrace Marshall coming into the factor with uh, receptions and targets and all this other stuff. But they really need contributions out of that tight end position. Now, Ian Thomas, superior athlete, um, especially when you're comparing him with someone like Dan Arnold, who is kind of that boring, low volume type guy. But Tommy Tremble kind of offers you that little bit of an intrigue with the upside. Uh, Arnold is there on a two-year, $6 million contract. Four and a half is guaranteed, so he'll be likely utilized much like he's been throughout his career. Uh, coming off his career last year, 31 receptions, 438 yards, four touchdowns. Uh, Thomas had a great rookie year, 36, 333, two touchdowns, but hasn't been able to duplicate that success thus far. In 19 games over two seasons, at Notre Dame, Tommy Tremble was able to accumulate 35 receptions, 401 yards, four touchdowns. So he does have that pass catching ability that we've never seen at Notre Dame. He wasn't used as that pass catcher, that Kyle Rudolph, that Cole Komet. So Notre Dame has never really used that tight end position the way you want it to use, be used. But you see these guys coming out of there that are talented. I think Tommy Tremble is the next in that line of progression, a succession for the Notre Dame Fighter Irish coming to the National Football League. I think Ian Thomas will have that role this year. Tommy Tremble is the guy who's going to take over probably towards the end of the year. Started 2022. He's the guy you want to get on your roster, especially when you consider that. I don't think Ian Thomas is going to factor in quite yet as far as your fantasy rosters are concerned. That was pretty easy, but now we're going to head over to the big easy, and hopefully I queue up the right video here. Fake to Kamara. Hill. Flushed left. Looking. Has no one going to tuck it away and run. Going for the end zone. Touchdown! Ocean Hill running right, and he walks in for the touchdown. Keep fighting out there, get the coverage on the fullback. Here it comes. Taysom Hill rumbling in for another one. First and ten from the Falcons 15. As Hill sets, throws, end zone, touchdown! Traquan Smith. The last little clip there, Taysom Hill to Traquan Smith. That's going to have to happen more often than not in 2021 here, especially when you consider recently the uh, injury news to Michael Thomas. He's looking at a, probably a four to six month period in which he's going to be off with uh, after going through surgery. That is a huge blow to a New Orleans Saints team that doesn't have pass catchers that really impose a fear into op their opposition as well. Now, at the quarterback position, we'll talk about pass catchers here shortly, but let's talk about the guys who will be slinging that ball around. You got Jameis Winston out there versus Taysom Hill. Now, my boy there, Calvin, he has been leading the hype train when it comes to Taysom Hill from the end of last season to right now. He has been claiming, staking that claim that Taysom Hill will be the starter for the New Orleans Saints moving forward. And I have no reason not to believe him. He's there in uh, New Orleans. He's in that Louisiana area. He's got his finger right on the pulse of Saints Nation. Now, let's take a little bit of a deeper look. We talk about it a little bit. Uh, Peyton was talking to Lindsey Rhodes here not too long ago, uh, a couple of years back when uh, Teddy Bridgewater came in. It was because they couldn't replace what Taysom Hill did elsewhere. Now, last year, Breeze went down again. Taysom Hill assumed that number that backup, that number one quarterback position, and he, he did all right. He filled in okay. The Saints won their games that they needed to win, and Taysom Hill didn't do anything to lose those games. Now, one of those games, he was the starting quarterback opposite of the Denver Broncos, who were starting their fifth-string quarterback that time based on COVID, but we're not going to go there right now. Now, when we talk about Hill being called upon in that injury there by Sean Payton, um, it's because Hill has an understanding of how Payton wants to run this offense. Uh, and they give him the proper time to prepare. They, they talk that it could have gone to James Winston. I don't believe that. I, I think the more preparation you give James Winston – the more preparation Taysom Hill is going to get, the more comfort he's going to get in that offense. Sean Payton really wants Taysom Hill to be the guy. Now, we kind of talked back and forth. In four games as a starter last year, Hill went 3-1. and one. That's key. you got to win games. If you're going to play in the National Football League, you're going to have to win some games. Now, he went 80, uh, 88 for 121, 928 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. He had a nice, solid 72.7 .7 completion percentage as well as he ran the ball 39 times for another 200 yards and four touchdowns. So you take a look at this, four games, seven touchdowns, 
1,200 yards uh, all purpose. You know, if you get put up 1,200 yards in four games, averaging 300, that's solid with a 72% passing percentage. If you can kind of get that ratio of passing touchdowns up and lowering the interceptions down over the course of the season, I think the Saints could be in a good position. Not a great position, but a good position, a manageable position in 2021. Now, Winston is the definition of a gunslinger. We talk about Brett Favre and his gunslinging abilities, but I don't even think Winston can see where he's throwing the ball half the time. But he did have that LASIK surgery. He's got some pretty good off-season camp going on right now to prepare him for 2021. Now, he gets back there. He cocks it back. He grips it and rip it. And we, he threw up prayers to the guys such as Mike Tom or Mike Thomas. Now you got me thinking Mike Thomas again. We'll get him a little bit later. Mike Evans back in Tampa Bay. Chris Godwin back in Tampa Bay. And let's face it, Evans probably boosted that completion percentage for Winston. If it wasn't for Mike Evans, I think Winston's touchdowns would have been a lot lower and those interceptions would have been a lot higher. Uh, but hey, we'll see what happens here with, uh, with the Saints in 2021. Uh, with over a year to prepare, quality coaching staff making a difference. Uh, let's not forget, back in 2019 with Evans and Godwin, he did throw for over 5,100 yards. But I won't call, I'm going to call my shot here. I'm going to stand with my boy Calvin. I'm going to call Taysom Hill as the guy to own here with the Saints. Heck, I've even drafted him in the 12th round in Superflex just to have him in my roster. Now, let's move on to these pass catchers. We talked about Michael Thomas is going to miss a considerable amount of time. Behind him, it gets pretty green, pretty thin. We talk about Trey Quan Smith. Uh, we talk about Marquez Callaway. We could talk about Jawan Jennings. Man, we're getting we're getting really thin. Now, hopefully, they see some things coming out of camp. Some players get cut. Some guys are interested in. Last year, when Michael Thomas went down, Emmanuel Sanders was the guy to step up. When Emmanuel Sanders wasn't quite firing 100%, Jared Cook was there. Both those guys are gone. Emmanuel Sanders off to Buffalo. Jared Cook off to Los Angeles to the Chargers. Now we kind of talk about this. Now, who, who's that guy? Deontay Harris. He stepped up. He had some games, but he's more of a special teams kind of guy. So let's kind of walk us through these um, pass catchers. Drake Juan Smith kind of emerged as a okay-ish weapon last year. In 14 games, he had 34 receptions, 448 yards, four touchdowns. Maybe we get a fourth-year breakout. Hey, you know, Corey Davis was late to break out. Maybe we can expect that with Trey Quan Smith in 2021. Uh, another third-rounder, the Saints would like production, is their second-rounder, and Adam Troutman as a rookie, 15 catches, 171, one touchdown. In his four years at Dayton as a flyer, 30, he was pretty impressive, 178 receptions, 2,295 yards, 31 touchdowns. Adam Troutman is a tight end. I think you need to get on your roster. I think you got to own him. I think he's going to have that good second season ahead of him, especially where you're getting him late in drafts. I think he could give you tight end one type numbers. I think he could slide into the conversation within that top 12 tight ends. Deontay Harris, off for speed, more of a special teams kind of guy, five foot six, 170. Um, he's been in the league for two years, undrafted free agent. Last year, 26 receptions, 210 yards, one touchdown. Marcus Callaway, second year pro out of Tennessee, respectable rookie season. 21 receptions, 213 yards, only 27 targets. Now, he's got that size that we kind of look for there, 6'2", 205. Had some good college production at the University of Tennessee. 91 receptions, 1,633 yards, 13 touchdowns, 17.9 yards per reception. Now, this has to be Traquan Smith. There, there's no doubt about it. The biggest benefactor, we talk about... Who's going to catch passes? It's going to be Alvin Kamara. He's going to get his. He's going to have to be the alpha receiver slash running back. I think Latavius Murray is going to have a big season, especially off the get-go. The longer Michael Thomas is out, the more involved Alvin Kamara is going to get into the passing game, which means the more involved Latavius Murray is going to get into the run game. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind when we're thinking about how to evaluate everything going on offensively for the Saints. Taysom Hill will be that quarterback. He gives him another kind of running back out of the backfield. Now, we could see Taysom Hill chuck the ball 40 yards, run it down, and catch it himself. That may be their best wide receiver, two wide receiver, three option there. But Kwan Baker is another guy I'm keeping my eye on the Saints. I want to see how training camp goes for him. I think he's a solid rookie. Loved his tape. Loved the small school guys. You know where my heart is. But Traquan Smith, you have to step up. You have to be that wide receiver one in Michael Thomas's absence. And let's face it, I think the Saints feel comfortable enough with what they got because they've probably known about the injury to Michael Thomas and the cut recovery time that's going to take probably since June, maybe even May. 
and they never went out and signed anyone major off a of free agency. They haven't done nothing yet. I think they believe in what they have, and Traquan's got to be that guy to step up. Now, without further ado, we head to your Super Bowl champions in Tampa Bay. Brady deep down the middle for Evans. Inside the 30 of Carolina, and Mike Evans is down to the 21. Here's Jones. Stiff arm. End zone. Ronald Jones with a touchdown for the Bucs. Brady pumps and throws. Back shoulder for Evans, and just like that, touchdown Tampa Bay. How scary of a thought is it that Tom Brady, by his own admission, did not have a full grasp of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offensive playbook last season. And all he did was go on to win another Super Bowl championship. In fact, he was so good. He's bringing so much luck down to south, uh, the south there, to Florida, to Tampa Bay, that even the Tampa Bay Lightning knocked off my Montreal Canadiens for the Stanley Cup. But that's not it. The Tom Brady oozing of success was so strong that not only did the Buccaneers, the Bucks, the Tampa Bay Bucks winning the Super Bowl, but the Milwaukee Bucks ended up winning the NBA championship. You know how good you have to be to be able to get the the Aaron Rodgers another championship? That's impressive, Tom Brady. Now, last year, he's he's got some weapons there in Tampa. We talked about it. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. You know, Tyler Johnson's there, Antonio Brown. We can go on and on about the receivers. I'm not concerned there. It's interesting to see how it's going to go. We know the pecking order, 1A, 1B, Evans, Godwin. That's going to be settled. How, how it works out after that between Antonio Brown, we know he's probably slotting in because of his comfort level with Tom Brady and vice versa. He's probably going to be the wide receiver three. But let's move into the tight end position. Gronk is going to Gronk. He's going to be there. You got Cameron Braid, and you got O.J. Howard, who was out of the University of Alabama, maybe the most talented uh, tight end that year coming out. Now, it took a while for Gronk to get up to speed, but there was no doubting the Brady-Gronk connection lived, especially when we got into the, off, the playoffs there. But with an offseason to prepare and get that dust officially shaken off in 2021, this could be the year of Gronk. Like Gronk had a good year. Not off the get-go, but he ended the season strong. I think he could take that strong ending and bring it to the start here of 2021, just simply because he's getting himself back into football shape. He, he was coming out of retirement. He was out partying. He was doing Gronk-type things, and now he's back. He's had a full year, as well as Brady, to get under the same playbook. Look for Gronk to have a good season. Now, Cameron Brate is a very solid tight end option. You could do worse than him. He's probably better for the Buccaneers than he is for your fantasy roster, but he was kind of more of an afterthought last year when it came down to how the Bucs used him. This was probably his worst statistical season since 2015. And that year he had 28 catches, 282 yards, and only two touchdowns. Now he's listed third on the depth chart behind both Gronk and OJ Howard. And he signed that huge six-year $41 million contract that runs right till 2024. I think we got I think the depth chart's got this right. You got Gronk up top, you got Braid on the bottom, and you got OJ Howard right in the middle of the, the um, 19th overall selection in 2017. Howard's been a bust. Let's call it the way it is right now. He's never exceeded 45 re receptions or 600 yards, and that was even in college. His best NFL season was 30 uh, 34 receptions, 565 yards, five touchdowns, and that may be his ceiling. Uh, Brady only targeted him 19 times in the four games prior to his injury. You know he's trying to build that rapport. That offseason didn't help. COVID didn't help last year. But we'll see how this shakes out. Right now I got a Gronk. I got it Howard. And then I got a Brady. I think that's how Brady's got it too. Now where it gets really, really interesting is at that running back position. You got Ronald Jones there. You got Uncle Lenny there. If it's playoff Lenny, this is a different story. But this is Uncle Lenny. You got Keyshawn Vaughn, who they draft. You got Giovanni Bernard, which they signed as a free agent out of Cincinnati. This looks like it's going to shape up to be like a major headache for fantasy owners trying to figure out who is who, how this is going to break down. Is Jones going to be guy? Is Fournette going to be guy? Who's going to be the guy? Now, Jones led the pack last season, 192 carries, as opposed to Fournette chipping in with 97. Keyshawn Vaughn had 26. And then we've seen Lenny kind of get used sparingly until the playoffs. Now, Rojo has had back-to-back -back quality season. Not great season, but quality. Uh, 1,700 yards, 
364 carries over the last couple of years, 4.7 yards per carry, then chipping in with 49 or sorry, 59 receptions, 474 yards and a touchdown, proving he could be that third down back. Now we've seen we've seen Brady get after him a couple times for drop passes. Brady will do that. And I think that's iron sharpening iron kind of mentality. We talk about the competitive nature of Tom Brady. Ronald Jones is going to have to be that guy. He's going to have to step up. He's going to be able to make those catches and be utilized more in that run game. Now, Keyshawn Vaughn out of Vanderbilt uh, uh, via Illinois at some point uh, simply just wasn't utilized as a rookie. Those 31 touches, playing in only 10 games, you know, he's not even a lock to dress on Sundays. And I don't think that changes as far as the way Tampa Bay views him. I think he's going to be fourth on this depth chart, no matter how you look at it. And then you got uh playoff Lenny as he is known is a complete wild card we've seen what he could do in Jacksonville he could be in every he could be a workhorse back he can get involved in the passing game he can find the end zone there's not much that Lenny can't playoff Lenny can't do but which Lenny are you going to get the one they had in the regular season or the one they had in the playoffs that is to be to be determined he isn't overly effective in that running game between the tackles with only about 416 yards on 124 carries last year Sorry, I'm getting my I'm getting ahead of myself. That's Gio Bernard there. Um, we're going to see this as a full fledged committee until there's some injuries that kind of settle things down. I think that, I think the one A role is going to be between uh, Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones. They're the two guys that are going to be feeding off each other. One of them is going to win that starting role, and the other is going to be the backup with Gio Bernard, who's sitting as third on the depth chart, probably filling in as that third down running back. And we know Gio Bernard can carry the load because he's done it in Joel Mixon's absence previously in Cincinnati. Now he isn't overly effective in the running game, going back to those 416 yards on 124 carries last year. But in 16 games, Bernard finished second on the Bengals in rushing behind Mixon, who only played those six games. So how, what can, how can we expect this to kind of shape out? If you didn't quite understand a lot of what I was saying, because I was talking very fast and not making a whole lot of sense, let me slow down. Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette, 1A, 1B. Neither of them have taken complete control of that position. It could go either way right now. I would bet that it's going to be Ronald Jones getting that first crack at it with Leonard Fournette not getting fully utilized unless there's an injury to Jones. Now, they're going to take targets. They're going to take touches away from each other. But And Gio Vernardi... Giovanni Bernard is going to have a role in this offense on third down. Now, if something were to happen to both both uh, Ronald Jones and Leonard Fournette, Giovanni Bernard can step up and play that every down back. But I think they're visioning him how they had LaShawn McCoy penciled in last year, but that didn't quite work out for them. They're going to the well again with Gio Bernard, and we'll see how this shakes out. Either way, this offense and this defense did not lose anything in the offseason. They're coming back even stronger. The Super Bowl champs have another offseason to kind of get in tune with one another. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's another Super Bowl run in these bucks because right now everything's coming up Brady. And with that said, that is their final stop in our training camp tour here. We've now previewed every division when it comes down to training camp and the battles we're watching stay tuned for more videos we're going to talk sleepers we're going to talk bus we're going to talk about just about everything top players under 25 you name it we're going to talk about it here on the viper bites and with that being said thanks for stopping in thanks for listening and we'll see you around <laughs>